Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The this Offspring. Is Nathan this East. is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl Amy. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Jeff Perlman, author of Football for a Buck, The Crazy Rise and Crazier Demise of the USFL, and you are listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Well, this took a minute for me to get everything set up. I made a wrong turn on Bo Balboa and got 20 minutes behind schedule and then had to work hard to get everything set up. But here we are. We're doing it. And also in-house, we've got Nick Davis, who it was your idea, actually, to grab Jeff for the show. We did your actually your episode is about to post up next week. And uh, you did a great documentary on Ted Williams. So we got a lot of uh, creative people that know about sports. I actually interviewed John Brankus uh, two days ago. No, yesterday. And he's the sports science guy. So it's all sports this week on the go. Break It Down show. So thank you, fellas, both Very for cool. being here. Yeah, of course. You got it. Hey, so, Jeff, uh, your book, tell us a little bit about the USFL. This is awesome. Well, the USFL, United States Football League, was a spring football league. Lasted from 1983 to 85. It was, it, was, uh, it was the idea, the brainchild of a guy named David Dixon, who was a New Orleans art dealer, wealthy man. And back in the 60s, he was annoyed that the NFL would not come to New Orleans. So he had this idea for a spring football league to sort of give an alternative to the NFL. But then the NFL brought the Saints to New Orleans, and he kind of dropped it. But he never fully forgot it. And in the 80s, he returned to the idea of spring football. His whole thinking was, the only reason football takes place in the fall is because long ago, Princeton Rutgers played a game in the fall, the first ever game. And that's why football is a fall sport. But it doesn't have to be a fall right. sport. <laughs> there's, a, there's a car. And, uh, and uh, so he just had this idea for spring football. And in the 80s, he kind of brought it back and people were interested. And all of a sudden, 1983, you had this spring alternative to the NFL. And the league was... Jeff, when it got started, I know it was supposed to be a spring league. And it, it seemed like it was like just manna from heaven for sports fans because it was like, wait, spring football, sure, why not? Right. And then, but then all of a sudden, at some point, and it seemed successful, right? But, but it, as you tell it in your book, which I haven't read yet, you know, who's, 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 who's mostly responsible for it, uh, it going to fall and ultimately dying? Yeah. So it's almost like going backwards, but oftentimes the story starts at the end. So, and I actually, I kind of like this. I don't know your guys' political beliefs. I don't care about your political beliefs. It's not actually a political, it's not even a political book, but it does happen to involve the 45th president. So the league started in 1983. Its first season was very, it was good. It was successful. It had its issues, but it was good. Uh, leading into the 84 season, Donald Trump, at the time, a relatively unknown New York real estate investor, wow. bought the New Jersey Generals of the US of L. And in the lead up to buying the team, he talked about how much he loved the USFL and spring football was great and this is going to be awesome. And as soon as he uh, became the owner of the Generals, it was, we need to move to fall. We need to take the NFL on directly. Uh, spring isn't for, for football. Spring is a time for baseball, blah, 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 blah. And the other owners are like, what the hell is this guy talking about? Like, where did this come from? You never mentioned this before you bought the team. And around this time, he arranges a meeting with Pete Rozelle. He pays for a suite. Donald Trump does at the Pierre Hotel in New York City. And he says to Roselle, um, I don't care about the USFL. This league doesn't mean anything to me. I'm all about getting an NFL team. I don't care about the USFL. I want to get an NFL team. And what do I need to do to get in the NFL? And Roselle says to him, Roselle was a very powerful guy, the head of the NFL. He said, as long as I'm the commissioner of the NFL, as long as my heirs are involved in this league, you will never have a spot in the NFL. Because he, he, he kind of viewed Trump as a con man. As a huckster, just didn't buy his he, stuff. He viewed Trump as a con man? He did. He saw it early on. <laughs> and um, he really did. He saw it early on. He saw it early on. He just And also, I always say it's like Donald Trump comes to Pete Rozelle and says, I want an NFL team. I don't care about the USFL. It's almost like you start dating someone who cheated on their last spouse. And she says, but I'm going to be loyal to you. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, I guess I'll take your word for it. You know, and some people do. Pete Rozelle didn't. And basically, Trump did everything he could after that meeting to push the USFL to fall, to have a confrontation with the NFL, because he thought he could force either a merger, he could force a lawsuit, and ultimately his team would be uh, sort of absorbed by the NFL. Right. And it never happened. The whole thing ended up in disaster. 
and the USFL died after three years. That's a very abridged version of what happened, but it was a... Yeah, but yeah, where in this is Herschel Walker? Where does he fit in? Because when he was signed to the Generals, I remember thinking, oh, perfect, he's Joe Namath. Like, yeah. you know, when Joe Namath went to the AFL, all of a sudden it was, wow, they're a legitimate league. They can compete with the NFL. And sure enough, then they merged and, you know... The rest yeah, sort of but that worked history. out well for the AFL. Yeah, but so where would where did her was Herschel Walker there the first year? No, so, oh yeah, so Herschel Walker basically was the he was the nuclear bomb at that time of football. It's funny, younger fans wouldn't remember like you know what back in the day we weren't watching games everywhere. You know, we couldn't watch any game. We couldn't be yeah. sitting here in California and watch Delaware play New Hampshire on TV, which yeah. you can now, you know, or online at least. Or even like if you went to your local game, wherever you were from, there was no promise it would even be recorded right. at all. Right. Like it was just a one-time it experience. It was a one-off. You were yeah. going to see it, right. So at that time, Herschel Walker was, do you remember Herschel Walker? Yeah, totally. Herschel Walker was the star in college football. Yes. He had won the Heisman Trophy at Georgia. He led him to the national championship game. He was the icon. And he was a junior. And at the time, the NFL would not take juniors. And Herschel Walker came from a very poor family in Wrightsville, Georgia, blue-collar family. Um, and he approached the USFL, and he said, I want to, I basically, I want to get paid. Yeah. And the USFL said, they debated it. They debated the idea of taking juniors. And then um, they said, okay. And he signed with the USFL out in 1983, right before the first season. And for the NFL, that was a nuclear bomb. It was Holy, am I allowed to curse on your podcast? I think so. It was yeah, holy yeah. shit. <laughs> fuck yeah. It was holy shit. What the hell just happened here? Like, how did this guy go to the US of L? This guy is your prototypical NFL. He's going to be an NFL star for the next 10 years. Yeah. He's a going franchise to the US star. Oh, yeah. He was going to be the number one pick in any draft he was in. And he goes to the USFL. And that same year, the 83 draft, it was like the, Uf- the NFL saw the USFL as a joke. Eh, new league, who gives a crap? Spring, it's a joke. But then players started signing. They got Craig James out of Southern Methodist, SMU. They got Tim Spencer out of Ohio State. Tremaine Johnson out of Grambling. Reggie Collier uh, out of Southern Miss. All these guys who were supposed to go to the NFL would jump into the USFL. Yeah. And it was like, that was when it was really for the NFL. It was like, holy shit. This wasn't the XFL where they were just getting scraps. Yeah. This was, they were taking the guys the NFL wanted. It was a... Middle finger to the NFL. Also, like teams like Buffalo that were going to draft Jim Kelly, he's like, I just don't want to go there. Well, the the best story of all time is um, is so D- Jim Kelly is uh, he's in that eighty three quarterback class. Yeah, with, uh, Marino and Elway, Tony Eason, Ken O'Brien, Todd Blackledge. He's he's yeah. one of those guys. He's drafted by the Bills, but in the lead up to that draft, he told the Bills, "I don't want to go to you. I don't want to play in Buffalo." Well, the Bills draft him anyway. And he feels resigned. Crap, I guess I'm going to Buffalo. Him and his agent, this is a true story. It's one of the best stories ever. Him and his agent go to Buffalo to negotiate with the Bills. And Jim Kelly is not happy about it. Yeah. Because he does not want to play in the cold for a crappy team. George uh, Bruce Allen is the general manager of the Chicago Blitz. And he finds out that Jim Kelly and his agent are in Buffalo. Bruce Allen calls the Bills' offices, asks for Jim Kelly's agent. They say, who is this? He says, it's his brother. We're having a family emergency. He gets the agent on the phone. (laughs) And he says, listen, this is Bruce Allen from the USFL. I know Jim doesn't want to play in Buffalo. You know Jim doesn't want to play in Buffalo. Get the hell out of there. We will make you happy. I promise you. He leaves a meeting. He's told by, um, he's told by the USFL, you pick the team you want to play for. We'll put you there. Wow. He says, I want to play in Houston. Done. <gasps> the Bills are like, what the hell just happened? Yeah. And around that same time, the Bills star was this guy, Joe Cribbs, who was a halfback. He was a great running back out of Auburn. The Birmingham Stallions stolen from the Buffalo Bills. So the Bills lost their quarterback and their running back to the USFL. And they were just like, all these teams, all these teams were like, what the fuck Panicking. is going on here? Yeah. What is going on here? How is this happening? And it was just, it kept happening and happening. They were still, people don't get it. People who aren't alive don't get it. It was a nuclear attack on the NFL. It was incredibly exciting. I mean, it felt like it was like revolutionary. Um, as a baseball fan, I was even worried because I thought, well, is this going to eat into you know, baseball's right. popularity in the, in the summer. Right. Um, and, but so, and then when did, and Flutie came in the next year? Or yeah, for- so Flutie's the best. Flutie is, if you want to know about, so here's the thing about the USFL. I keep saying, so my book came out the same day as Bob Woodward's book. Yeah. Which is terrible time. <laughs> yeah, good job. Yeah, hey, nice job. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, it, right. it was 9-11 too, right? And it was 9-11. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was 9-11. <laughs> came out the same day as Woodward's book. And you guys both have a, Trump, a Trumpian root to your yeah, book. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and the other thing is, I'm a New Yorker. 
And 9-11 to me is just not a day to mess with. Yeah. When they said, because publishing has where it comes out on Tuesdays, and 9-11 was a Tuesday this sure. year. Sure. But I was very uncomfortable. People would say, when's your book coming out? I'd always say September. Or I'd say September 10th, <laughs> just because I couldn't say September. Anyway, all right, here's, like, I get Woodward's book, I'm sure, is great. But if you want to understand Trump, I'm not kidding. If you understand the U.S. of L. Trump, you understand President Trump. Here's the perfect example. Doug Flutie, you remember Doug Flutie? Yes. Boston College, Heisman Trophy winner, 1985. He, uh, Flutie's coming out, and Donald Trump gives him the biggest contract in pro football history at the time. It was a, uh, a six-year, $8.3 million deal with three years guaranteed. It was huge money at the time. And he tells his partners with the generals, don't worry, the other teams are going to pay his contract. Say hey, what? Yes. <laughs> he writes a letter to the commissioner, Harry Usher, that I actually have, and the other owners, saying, I have done the USFL a huge favor by bringing Doug Flutie to our league, and the dividends are already clear. It was total bullshit. There were no great dividends. Like, attendance was plummeting by this point. The <laughs> dividends are already clear, and I expect all of you to pay. I was on MSNBC recently, and the host was a woman named Ale- uh, Alex Witt, and she said, um, that sounds like the Mexico wall. And I said, it is the Mexico wall. Right. They're going to pay for it. It's going to benefit us. The U.S. of our owners paid nothing, right? Nothing. <laughs> and I just want to say, when I say pass this prologue with the U.S. of our Trump, whether you like Trump or not, like the antics are exact. There was an owner, there was one owner in the U.S. of L who called out Trump's bullshit. Yeah. His name was John Bassett. He owned the Tampa Bay Bandits. He believed in the spring mission. He was all about spring. Uh, 1984, after the second season, John Bassett is diagnosed with, with two uh, spots in his brain, brain mm. cancer. As soon as that happens, Trump walks all over him. He just walks all over him. This guy's out of my way. No empathy, no sympathy, walks over him. It was John McCain 30 years before John McCain. John McCain, brain cancer. John McCain, the thorn in his side, walks all over him. These tactics, Donald Trump, USFL, guarantees there is a TV deal for us in the fall. There's a $90 million TV deal waiting for us. I promise you that. You could pick any number of things. It was total bullshit. There was no deal. It was a lie. It was actually a lie. It was just a (laughs) number invented by him. He had met with the TV uh, people, and they had nothing for him. So... Again, whether you love Trump's politics or not has nothing to do with this. Yeah. But the tactics are hauntingly similar. That's incredible. So you've wanted to write this book, or this has been like a passion project of yours, mm-hmm. I know. And, you know, you've written many other great sports books and bestsellers. And stuff, but this one, people told you it's not going to sell because nobody remembers this league. Nobody cares about it. Yeah, that is true. And, uh, and when you started, it was where was it in the in the sort of in the Trumpian chronology? When did you start it? Oh, was he already so running? funny. That's a funny thing. People are like, oh, another libtard writing a book. And I'm like, I got this book deal four years ago. Wow. Four years okay. ago. So I got the deal. I wrote a book called Gunslinger about Brett Favre. And I pitched that book four years ago. The book came out two years ago. So I got the book deal four years ago. And I had multiple bidders. And I said to Houghton Mifflin, I said, I really like the editor. And I said, would you give me, I would take less money to do Favre if you give me a deal to do the USFL book also. Because nobody wants a USFL book. Nobody. Yeah. Ten years. This has been ten years in the making of trying to get a USFL deal. Nobody wanted it. And they agreed. So, and I said, oh, I'll write the USFL book first. They're like, no, no, no. You're writing a Favre book first because that's the one we want. <laughs> so the weirdest part, like, theoretically speaking, this book could have come out two years ago yeah and nobody would be asking me maybe they'd be asking about trump in a very loose way right but it just it's the most people wouldn't believe me but you could see i have the book deals at home like it's the weirdest most coincidental sort of timing that yeah. it became a quote-unquote trump book just by nature of timing you'd also and i guess i'll grab the uh the picture for you because you put it up on social media of the letter from donald trump and it's just it's whether you like or hate the guy, you can hear what he does from back then. Like he congratulates himself on saving the league, yes. you know, and, and the part about getting the owners to pay for it. Oh, it's just classic. Tell me about Steve Young, because it's another part of this nuclear bomb. Here's a highly touted guy who he's like, I'm not going to go to Tampa. Are you crazy? Yeah, right. Well, actually, it wasn't even Tampa. So what happened was he ended up going to Tampa. Actually, when he got he got to the Buccaneers after the league folded. Okay. And he said. I can't believe the shit talent around here was much better in the USFL than the Buccaneers. Wow. He didn't say shit because that man does not curse, but you get the idea. Yeah. All right. Steve Young coming out of BYU. Now he's a Hall of Famer. He's one of four Hall of Famers to start in the USFL. I just want to say it was uh, Reggie White, Gary Zimmerman, Jim Kelly, Steve Young, all in the Hall of Fame, all from the USFL. Right. Steve Young is coming out of BYU, and the Cincinnati Bengals have the number one pick in the 84 draft. 
much like Jim Kelly. Yeah. Steve Young has literally zero interest in going to Cincinnati, Ohio to play right. football. Right? Yeah. Uh, he's an East Coast kid who's playing in Utah. Blah, blah, blah. Didn't Elway do the same thing? Didn't he say, I wasn't going to go to Baltimore? Yeah. Right? And he ended up forcing the trade to yeah. uh, Denver. So this is not, NFL does not like any of that. No. Yeah. No. They're supposed to be the boss. The last right. thing they want are players calling the shots. You guys have always like, you can call the shots. We don't care as long yeah. as we are playing for us. So Steve Young is coming out of BYU. His agent is Lee Steinberg, right. who's great for this book, by the way. He actually, it's funny, you were just in Newport. He literally has a, you probably drove past his office in Newport. He's the best. And Lee represented Steve Young. And Lee Steinberg says to Steve Young, well, what about the USFL? What about the USFL? Uh, I don't know. And uh, actually what happened is, I, I skipped a step. The number two guy in the USFL office was this guy named Steve Earhart. He was the, the number two to the commissioner. And he lived in Greenwich, Connecticut. And there's a newspaper in Greenwich called the Greenwich Time, not the Times, the Greenwich Time. And Steve Earhart's home one day, and he's reading in the paper, BYU Steve Young home visiting his family in Greenwich. He's like, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to call the Young House and see if I can meet with Steve. Just because he sees this article in the Greenwich Time. He calls the Youngs. They're like, yeah, come on over. He goes over to their house. He's like, we would like you to consider the USFL. We would let you play where you want to play. You decide, blah, blah, blah. Where would you want to play? I mean, if I had to pick, I'd go to Los Angeles. Yeah. We can work that out for you. It's actually funny. The USFL drafts were totally fixed because if you look at the 84 draft, I think Steve Young was picked 10th, uh-huh. even though he was the best player in the country. Right. Because they waited for LA's pick to take him. So Steve <laughs> Young decides, all right, maybe I'll do this. And Lee Steinberg's agent starts negotiating with the Los Angeles Express, owned by this guy, uh, Bill Oldenburg, this SNL guy, turns out to be a total con man with like one, one millionth of the money he reports to having, purports to having. And they agree on a $42 million contract. It's actually an annuity. It's not getting paid all I remember front. this. It's yeah. all over years, right? Because there's this funny scene where um, Steve Young is getting taunted in a game in Washington. He's playing in Washington, and his mom's in the stands. And all the fans are cheering, taunting, $40 million down the drain, $40 million down the drain. And his mom stands up and says, it's an annuity. It's an annuity. <laughs> and they're like, fuck you, fuck you. So um, it's so great. But they negotiate this deal. It's going to be 40. And they call, he calls the Cincinnati Bengals, Mike Brown, the head of the Bengals, and says, just so you know, if you're willing to match, we'll, Steve will sign with Cincinnati if you're willing to pay him $40 million. Yeah. The GM basically is like, yeah, go fuck yourself. That's yeah. not happening. So he goes in to negotiate with the Express. The owner is this guy, Bill Oldenburg. He's a nut job. He's absolutely batshit crazy insane. And um, they go to his office to negotiate the terms of the deal. And Bill Oldenburg's upstairs. It's his birthday, getting drunk. Lee Steinberg, Steve Young downstairs negotiating with his assistants. And it's taking a long time to get all the paperwork done. And every couple hours, Bill Oldenburg comes down. He's getting drunker and drunker. Why the fuck isn't this done? It'll be done soon, sir. Okay. Why the fuck isn't this done? It'll be done soon. Finally, after like five hours, he intercoms down. Get Steve Young and <laughs> Lee Steinberg up here right now. They come up to his office. Just the two of them. He's wasted. Yeah. Cheeks are red, sloppy. He takes all the glasses on his bar and smashes them all. He grabs a chair like the ones we're sitting in and runs to throw it out his penthouse window. Steve Young grabs him. He's like, I'm offering you $40 million and you're fucking turning it down. And he says to Steve Young, you know what? Fuck you. Fuck the Mormon That's church because Steve Young's Mormon. Yeah. Steve Young goes, Steve Young, who he's his his. Namesake is on the damn school. Yes, and he happens to be one of the nicest human beings on the planet. Sure. Steve Young, he's a great, wonderful man. He he goes up to, to Bill Oldenburg, starts jabbing, he jabs him in the chest and says, if you talk to me like that one more time, I'm going to sock you. Which is such a Richie Cunningham, <laughs> Steve Young kind of thing. To I'm say. really going to give it I'm to you. I'm going to give it to you this time. Bill Oldenburg goes, get the fuck out of my office, both of you. This deal is off. Get uh-huh. the fuck out. It's 2 in the morning in San Francisco. Steve Young... Lee Steinberg standing on the street trying to figure out how they're going to get to Lee Steinberg's house. The next morning, a a sober, hungover Bill Oldenburg calls with an apology. The money is too good to pass up, and Steve Young signs with the Express. It's total U.S. about. There are so many stories from this book. I'm not just saying this because I wrote it. I swear to God. I've never written about more insane uh, yeah, people yeah. in insane circumstances in the U.S. about. It's just a different level of batch of crazy. So was it? I mean, you you mentioned the, the the sort of the fix was in in terms of the draft. Like, was it competitive? I mean, did they care about who was winning and who was losing? Well, the teams did, but the league was really at that point number one priority: survival. I'll give you a perfect example: 1984 draft. That same draft, there were. 
So the league did something really dumb in hindsight. They went from 12 teams in 83 to 18 teams in 84. They had six teams expansion after one season, which is insane because they did it because each team had to pay $6 million. So it was an influx of money that they wanted. Okay. Mike Rozier was a Heisman Trophy winner at Nebraska. Do you guys remember Mike Rozier? <laughs> yeah, remember? barely, but yeah. Good running back. Rozier's coming out, and the commissioner of the league, Chet Simmons, uh, calls the, the GM of the Pittsburgh Maulers, a new team in Pittsburgh, George Heddleston, and says, if you guys have the number one pick, can you sign Mike Rozier? And George Heddleston, the GM, is like, wait, are you saying if we can sign Mike Rozier, you will give us the number one pick? Because he didn't know the draft was fixed. Yeah. And Chet Simmons is like, I'm not saying I am. I'm not saying I'm not, but I kind of am. Yeah, answer the question. Right. <laughs> Heddleston's like, yes, we can sign Mike Rozier, having no idea. Um, the draft comes. If you look at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette that day, yeah. headline, banner headline, Maulers win first pick in yours of our draft. <laughs> and they actually ended up signing Mike Rozier for a million bucks, so they did get him. So, yeah. So, okay, Reggie White plays in the league, too. How, does he make the move because of a financial thing, or was he not as sought after? I don't. Oh, re- no. I don't recall Reggie White in from the college days. I mean, it's a long time. So he ago, would, the other thing is like it was a uh, again. If you think about the time period, it was a time when we would not. You and I, you you grew up in California. I grew yeah. up in New York. We wouldn't see a Tennessee Volunteers game on sure, TV at all, right? ever. Yeah, literally zero. I couldn't tell you. I could tell you maybe one guy from those. Yeah, teams. if they played Notre Dame, okay, right. or a bowl game. If they were in a bowl sure. game, then year, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Like a blue bonnet bowl. But there weren't those bowls didn't even exist back then. Remember, yeah. there were a very yeah, limited yeah, number yeah. of bowls. So you wouldn't see Tennessee. So Reggie Wright was a stud coming out of college. And the Memphis Showboats offered him a ton of money to come out. And it was cool for him because it was a regional. He got to stay local. Yeah. For them, it was a great idea. The funny thing, so here's the funny thing about Reggie Wright. Reggie Wright comes to US of I'll tell you two stories about him real quick. Okay. He's painfully naive. And one day he goes shopping at this men's clothing store in Memphis. And he's, he's making a lot of money. But they convince him the well-dressed man needs a lot of dress socks. And he winds up buying 57 pairs of dress socks and spending like $2,000 on dress clothes. And he comes back to his, his apartment, and his roommate was a quarterback, Walter Lewis. And Walter's like, why do you buy all these socks? And he's like, well, I thought I was supposed to. He's like, no, you're not supposed to buy that many socks. And word gets out that he bought all these socks, and fans start showing up at Memphis home games, <laughs> oh swirling socks in the air in support of Reggie White. And the other thing about Reggie White, Reggie White, devoutly religious, devoutly religious. Yeah. Man, uh, very good guy. A minister. Yeah, minister. Good. Said some things at the end of his career about gays that sort of took away from his, you know, like, that were a little regrettable, and I think now he were, he's deceased, sadly. But um, Reggie White's playing a game against the Birmingham Stallions. And the uh, center for the Stallions cut blocks him on a play. And Reggie White says to the nose tackle for Memphis, he goes, we're, uh, we're ch- this play, I'm playing nose tackle. He's like, all right, Reggie. Reggie lines up across from the center. He looks up at the center before the ball stopped. He goes, do you know Jesus? And the center goes, what? Hut, hut, hike, pam. Reggie White just slams a guy into the ground. He goes, you know Jesus now. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite Reggie White story is uh, when he was playing for the Packers, you know, I know what like you're the, gonna say. Is this a Tony Mandrits? I don't no. know. I don't know. Maybe I don't think so. But there is a young rookie who comes in and like you know they're doing like all their strength stuff. And so Reggie comes in and he puts up his weight on the bench press and he walks out. He's like, "I'm leaving. I'm out of here. No one's gonna beat that." And he's driving down the road, leaving training camp, and someone calls him on the phone like, "Reggie, you know the rookie just threw up, you know, four twenty two. And he's like, Rrr, "Stop!" <laughs> turns around, goes back, racks up more weight than anybody could ever do, and, and then leaves again. Yeah. yeah, he was naturally just just a, freak. a monster. Yeah. There were guys on that from that team. He didn't get the attention in the USFL that he probably should have because he was a defensive lineman playing in Memphis. But there were guys on that team who just talk. He was raw. He was super raw at that point. Yeah. But just unnaturally gifted. Yeah. Were there ever any uh, like really amazing plays in the USFL? Oh man, to me the the definitive <laughs> moment. It's kind of funny. I mean. The first USFL championship game was this amazing game. It's worth watching. It's on YouTube. It's a Michigan Panthers, Philadelphia Stars, and Denver. And there's this play. The, get, the play that wins a game for Michigan. Bobby Abair was a quarterback. Anthony Carter was their star wide receiver. Both those guys went on to very long, productive NFL yeah. careers. Abair hits Carter on this pass, and he just takes off down the field. And there was something really majestically beautiful about it. First of all, the Panthers had the sickest uniforms in pro sports. They had these... Their colors were maroon and champagne. Wow. Which just sounds badass. Champagne. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't silver or champagne. And Carter's wearing the USFL at that time. The NFL didn't have it this time. 
wide receivers could wear single digits. So the NFL at that time, you weren't allowed. So Anthony Carter is wearing this maroon and champagne number one streaking down the field. It sounds corny. It is one of the most beautiful and elegant looking plays ever. But here's the awesomeness of the USFL. It's a championship game. The USFL needs a great game. The Super Bowls have sucked of late. They have this great game. It's in Denver. They have a huge crowd. The weather's perfect. Bobby A. Bears the MVP. Everything's great. Before the game, Miller hosted a free beer party in the in the uh, parking lot. That's always a good idea. Yeah, always a good idea. <laughs> Especially with the high altitude. Like, combine everything. People are sloshed out of their minds at this game. With a minute and 30 left, fans decided it would be a good time to, to storm the field yes. and take down the goalposts, right? <laughs> okay. The Denver police is under strict orders. No one does anything to the field. Yeah. Okay? The, the game is brilliant. Everyone's thrilled. The USFL is thrilled. They're in the press box handing out, Bobby Bears, the MVP. This is great. And all of a sudden, everyone looks down. The police are macing people on the field. <laughs> they have police dogs biting and attacking people oh my God. on the field. So it is such a typical USFL moment. It's the prototypical USFL yeah, moment yeah. where great moment, but they just can't get out of their own way and dogs and mace on the field. Okay, so they have all these things where, like, like if if these couple of things would have lined up better, maybe they would have done. Actually, forget that. I want to ask this. So there must be some kind of Bo Jackson connection because he was really mad, you know, at the NFL and only kind of got there because they had screwed up his uh, eligibility. Yeah, and he's young enough. Was there any kind of connection? No, because he was too late. Too he late. Was just after a he came out late. after the US. And then who was who was like the last great player in the door? And then everybody else is like, it's, it's it's too late on the oh, other end. That's an interesting question. So, um. One thing that happened in 1985, the first pick in the draft by the Birmingham Stallions was Reg. Uh, excuse me, was Jerry Rice. Okay, first, second considered going to the Birmingham Stallions and wound up not going. By '85, they had a draft in 1985. It was, it was it was really their last draft. They had one in '86, but nobody paid attention to. By '85, you could see the league wasn't it was limping, so there were no guys. Flutie was probably the last really big name guy to go to the USFL. But the truth of the matter is with Flutie is, I mean, Trump was, I was going to say he would admit this. I don't think he would because he doesn't admit things like this. Yeah. He didn't know anything about football. Right. Like he actually didn't know anything about football. He saw Doug Flutie as a, as a tickets. Right. And he did get on the cover of SI and he probably, I mean, their attendance wasn't great, but so Flutie was the last guy to come in who was a big name. And the thing about Flutie, it's interesting is he probably would have been a fourth or fifth or sixth round NFL pick. He was an undersized quarterback. Right. Uh, he, no NFL team wanted a five nine quarterback. If anything, maybe you convert him into a third down back or Some something. Some kind like of that. other back, yeah. Yeah. So Trump saw him for tickets and didn't realize he wasn't that good. And the funny thing is, the New Jersey Generals in nineteen eighty four had a great quarterback. Their quarterback was Brian Sipe, who'd been the MVP of the NFL in nineteen eighty with Cleveland, and they got rid of Sipe for Flutie. And Sipe was a far superior player. But it wasn't about that to Trump, it was about tickets. Were there things that the league did that the NFL like sort of later realized, oh, we want that too? Oh. So many. The, this is what people say, like, uh, what's the impact of the USFL? And it's enormous, but people don't realize it. Uh, the two-point conversion, USFL. Coach's challenge, USFL. Wow, that's really early. The cameras zooming up and down the field, USFL. Single digits for wide receivers, USFL. Um, the run-and-shoot offense, where you have four and five wide receiver sets. The no-huddle offense, both those start in the USFL. Obviously, the USFL brought the NFL about 200 players. You know, um, promotions. The USFL, when the NFL was just a stodgy, boring league, the USFL was doing stuff that was absolutely insane. There was a team in Boston that then moved to New Orleans, that then moved to Portland called the Breakers. Three cities, three years. Their coach was a guy named Dick Corey. Dick Corey would have a contest before every home game. Fans would submit plays, and they would pick one play submitted by a fan and run it in the game. And not only that, the winning fan got to stand on the sideline and hold his wires Wow. During the game, which is really cool. Yeah. The Tampa Bay Bandits had these contests where you would win a million dollars, but then you read the fine print. So someone would be like, how does it feel to be a millionaire? Like the guy, they'd win. Oh, this is amazing. And then you read the fine print. It was $50,000 a year starting in 20 years. Oh, my God. So someone right now is still probably getting paid some, you know. <laughs> so they had a uh, they had a, a car giveaway where they drove 10 cars onto the yes. field. And fans would get one of the 10 cars. And one of the fans walked onto the field and stole one of the cars that nobody even noticed. It was like, we're giving away nine cars. you know. Like, <laughs> but they, they really made it fan interactive, which the NFLs took a lot from. 
Mm. My buddy Mark is a sideline guy doing the audio stuff for the Raiders. He's a big Raiders fan and everything else. And, yeah, like, what a great thing to do to, like, why don't you come down and be yeah. part of the family for the day, you know? Oh, yeah. They yeah. made it very fan-friendly. They were about they were about sales. Like, the Tampa Bay Bandits, one of their co-owners, was a recently uh, departed Burt Reynolds. Yeah. Burt Reynolds yeah. was super involved in the public relations of that team, you know, and, like, bringing celebrities to – you never saw celebrities on the sidelines at NFL games. Then there were celebrities all over the place. The, uh, the LA Express, Lee Majors, the $6 million yeah. man. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, like, all these guys would be on the sidelines of games, watching the games. They made it feel like an event. What happened – and maybe your book doesn't go into this, but a few years ago, the USFL was trying to come back. Yeah, but it wasn't the USFL. It was someone using the wasn't name the, of the USFL. Does someone own the name still? Someone just bought the name. Uh, I don't know if they still own it. They did a few years ago. I'll tell you a funny thing. It's an amazing legacy thing. Okay, the USFL is coming to an end. They don't have any money left. There used to be a weekly highlight show called uh, This is the USFL. And it was done by two filmmakers, Mike Tolan and Gary Cohen. Mike Tolan, they both went on to really long careers uh, doing documentaries. and Like the movie Radio is Mike Tolan. Okay. And Summer Catch is Mike Tolan. Okay, but at the time, they did the weekly highlight show. Gary Cohn is called into the office of the USFL. The guy says to him, look, man, we don't have the money to pay you, but I'm going to give you something more valuable. I'm going to give you the vault. And he's like, what do you mean the vault? You're going to own all the USFL film footage. Huh. And Gary Cohn is like, why the hell do I want film footage of a three-year-old <laughs> league that nobody's watching anymore? He's like, just trust me. You're going to want it. Okay, fast forward in life. Buying NFL footage, preposterously expensive. Yeah. And if you, are, if you are whatever the official TV is of the NFL, you have rights where you can use it. Yeah. If you're, so if you're Zenith and you're, you're the official TV of the NFL, you get to use NFL footage. But if you're Sony, you don't. If you watch, I can give you a million examples from SpongeBob to Friday Night Lights to wow. a gazillion different commercials. And you look closely, it's like Tampa Bay Bandits playing the Michigan Panthers. Gary Cohn, by owning those rights, made about $100,000 a year for decades Wow! just owning the U.S. of our rights. So he didn't think it was worth anything, and it was worth millions. millions. That's cool. And did those guys do – wasn't there an ESPN 30 for 30 about the U.S. Yeah, that was Mike Tolan who did it. Right. right. And uh, he went to see Donald Trump, and Donald Trump said something in that, in that documentary that I think infuriated more U.S. of our fans and players than anything that's ever been said. He basically gets up at the end of it. He's done with Mike. He was very dismissive of the, in that interview, and he goes, it was all small mm. potatoes about the USFL. And I've been saying this, and players said it to me, like, it wasn't small potatoes in them. It wasn't, forget the Steve Young's This episode of the Breaking Down football. Show is brought to you by Lions Rock You're the Rock backup center for the That's Oklahoma us. Outlaws. We publish, You're evaluate, and develop You're a middle linebacker for the Philadelphia like this one. Stars. Consult others you know, like, to build their own and there was one guy interviewed. He was a content and Portland Breakers quarterback. So if said every, that was his last time playing football. He said every day he wakes up and he looks at the picture of the 1985 Breakers. Or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, to call it small potatoes, it is. It is for that guy who is the backup center. He does get the I got the snap to Jim. Kelly. You know, otherwise, yeah, I'm at the YMCA, you know, making money, pushing towels, oh, yeah. hanging on, trying to get onto a practice yeah. squad somewhere, you know. I mean, there was a guy I interviewed, his name was Pete Rayford. He was a cornerback for the uh, San Antonio Gunslingers. Great guy. He was all USFL. He had like eight career interceptions in two years. Very, very good player. The USFL dies. He never gets another shot. He said, I went from playing professional football to picking up cigarette butts in a parking lot. You know, like his yeah. life ended up working out okay, but that was his job he got after league died. Like, it yeah. was such a swiping of glory, and I don't, I don't blame only Trump for the death of the league. There were a lot of culprits go around, but the dismissive nature that he viewed it as just another failed. Well, it just it, whatever it happened, yeah. and all right. these people are left yeah. out of work. So it sucks. Work. How close do they come to actually turning that last corner, or at least the next corner, to stay alive and stay viable? I mean, obviously the fall thing didn't work out, but they were pretty I close. Think if they'd never like, moved to fall, I think they'd never moved to fall. Everybody says 1987 was a player strike in the NFL. It was a huge yeah. strike. I think if the USFL had been around then, you would have had a massive influx of players to the USFL. I think the NFL would have panicked. It was, it was kind of the last year of pure anarchy in football. Um, the Jacksonville Bulls, there was no team in Jacksonville at the time. The uh, Memphis Showboats, there's no team in Tennessee at the time. The Baltimore Stars, there's no team in Baltimore. The Oakland Invaders, there was no team in Oakland. Birmingham Stallions, right. great market. And ironically and interestingly, the Jets had moved to New Jersey. The Giants were in New Jersey. I think Trump's plan of having a team in New York actually made sense. 
he just went about it in such a diabolical and rushed mm. way that it wasn't going to happen. Weird I think a lot of teams would have been absorbed. I mean, a lot, five or the, six, would have been absorbed by the end. Like you said, like the expansion to the team seemed rushed. Like they just couldn't sort of stay, you know, sort of small for a while and let it grow organically. It, it's really too bad. Right. Well, they panicked. It's like part of the plan was you're going to lose money at first. Like, there's no way you start a professional sports league from scratch and you're just going to make money. That was part of the plan. They all knew it. They all agreed to it. It's one thing to say you're going to lose money. It's another thing to lose money. And when someone comes along and says, we can make all this money in the fall, and you just drop $8 million on a year, and you're not used to losing money, it's kind of tempting. You know, there's a, there's a thing like in human nature. These guys are successful guys. They're business people. They're in this position they because, you know, they know how to make things work. Yeah. Chernobyl was burned down by a bunch of nuclear physicists. They know how to make a nuclear plant work, but you get to this point where you're like, let's correct. And like, well, we just turned right. the dial all the way to the left. Now we're going to turn the, you know, like you start to lose clarity on what the next step might be. Like, let's just make sure we grab, you know, five of the t- of the first round draft picks, that, like the big marquee names. And you just have that, and you just make these simpler things. But it's hard yeah. to do that. You know, it's easy to say in retrospect, just keep going. I also think the there's, a, uh, there's a competitive competitiveness with wealthy people. <laughs> I mean, there is. There's a competitiveness. Mm-hmm. Not all, but a lot. There's a competitiveness. And, yeah. all right, we're going to take it slow and steady. Well, shoot, the Michigan Panthers just signed three offensive linemen from the Pittsburgh Steelers, and now they're playing the championship game, which actually happened. If they're going to do yeah. that, I'm going to go sign a halfback. I'm going to go sign Joe Cribs from the Buffalo Bills. Well, if you're going to sign Joe Cribs, I'm going to go sign Chris Collinsworth. And Adam, like, it's one thing to say slow and steady wins a race. It's another thing to actually yeah. adhere to it. And the other thing I learned from this book, I really did, it's like you tend to assume that successful people, quote-unquote successful people, know what they're doing, and they don't always. You just assume, yeah. you know, oh, this guy made all this money. I'm going to follow his lead. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes it just happened, but it doesn't mean they're, they're brilliant. I have a technology show called Popping the Bubble, and we often talk to these people that are extremely young, and they have they are sought after for business. And it's be, partly because they have a lot of capability, but a lot of it is because things have just yeah. worked out through external things. And it's like all of a sudden, like, they're this path exactly. maker. Like, you know, like, how could you be 27 and be the path maker, you know? Well, I get people ask me a lot, like, oh, how do you, what's the key to writing books and blah, blah, blah. I don't fucking know. You know, like it's worked yeah. out for me, and I have my own path. But it doesn't mean it's going to work for you or you. And it certainly Jeff, doesn't make you, me. Are, um, Nick, you make movies all the time. What? How, how did? You, how do you get to do it? Yeah, it's the same exact thing. I mean, it's like you. You. It's just. It's a struggle every day, and it's like you know, setting up projects is ninety nine times out of a hundred sort of happenstance and luck, and you know, once in a great while, it sort of everything runs really smoothly but it's uh yeah there, there's no you know it's the great william goldman line about hollywood nobody knows anything and you know once you realize that the world is essentially a mickey mouse operation then you can start to succeed because it's like well if they're doing it i can do oh it. so don't you think like uh like the x factor of it all not for everyone but for a lot of people the x factor is hard work doggedness doing the shit that people don't want to do like man you get to write books for a living that's so cool right well, you don't see me sitting in a coffee <laughs> shop for 12 straight hours <laughs> digging through USFL media guides, making a Word file for each one. You know, like, you don't see me at Staples yeah. printing out 10,000 10, cop pages of notes. Like, it's one thing to want it. Yeah. I always say this to my students. Yeah. I teach at Chapman University as an adjunct. I always say, like, it's one thing to say I want it. It's another thing. To, do you want it or do you want it? Because a lot of the stuff is unpleasant. Yeah. It's drudgery. You know, like... You know what I mean? Like you don't just you don't just get to surf <laughs> off into the Pacific. You have to learn how to surf. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you did four hundred plus interviews for this book. Now imagine anything in life where you're like, I'm going to go sort through four hundred bits of information and then organize it into something. You know, like, we had Rob Nyer. His show is going to drop in a couple of days when his book Powerball comes out, and his like his ability to take and you know you know Rob like you must yeah, you at least know his work yeah, because. His ability to take the framework of a baseball game to tell a story, it's fantastic. But you don't only get to that brilliance by writing a million words on ESPN.com in the 90s. Like you have to do. So I always say, um, and let me know what you guys think about this. I always say like everybody's got a great idea. That's not, that's fucking normal. Everyone has that. What's hard is to execute that idea and turn it into something. What's harder than that 
is to take great ideas and continue to turn them into something so that someone finally goes, oh, shit, you have a great a bunch of great ideas. Like, it's not just, yeah, go write a book. Like, you've got to, you've got to. Well, and then once, once all of that happens, I totally agree. And then once all of that happens, it's like, does it line up with what people actually want at that moment? <laughs> right. I mean, as Jeff was saying, like, you know, if his USFL book had come out two years ago, or three years ago, let's say, like maybe people are less interested in it. But like right now, I think the time is just perfect for you. And, and you know, I, I hope and, you know, you're going to have a great ride with this book because it is entertaining. It is amazing stories. And because of Trump and also just like the way the world is right now, I think we want to hear about, you know, a bunch of loosey goosey kind of crazy people doing crazy things and not you know, not coloring within the lines and, and doing that in professional sports and having great time at it. I just think timing cannot be yeah. uh, underestimated. Can I tell you guys my craziest USFL story? Oh, I actually please. have like a hundred, but I'll give you my favorite. They, give me your hundred and, and then, or give me that one and then give me like okay. the 15. I'll give you the 15th first. My 15th favorite. <laughs> it's kind of funny. This is how crazy USFL. I, I was telling a friend of mine called last night who read the book and he's like, that Chuck Clanton story is incredible. And I was like, I actually forgot that story is even, the, even the, in the book. So this, this would probably be the 30th craziest story in the U.S. of Al. The Birmingham <laughs> Stallions had a safety named Chuck Clanton out of Auburn. And Chuck Clanton was great. He had 16 interceptions one season. He's a great, great defensive back. He had a girlfriend at the time, and he went out to a club with her. And she said he was, she was hungry, so Chuck went out and brought her back Burger King. And she was pissed that he brought him Burger King. And he's like, F you, I'm going home. And he goes home, and she comes to the apartment, and they get in a fight. And she stabs him in the hand with a knife. And the knife, a what? kitchen knife, uh, a big cutting knife. And the knife goes through his hand, straight through his hand. And instead oh. of going home, uh, uh. he goes to the Stallions uh, doctor, like in the Stallions facility. So he literally shows up in the team facility with his, a knife sticking out of both sides of his hand. Because he Jesus. didn't bring his girlfriend Burger King, the Burger King she wanted. He got him, like, the wrong sandwich at Burger King. And, of course, a couple weeks later, he's playing with this big gash in his hand they still have. So that's, like, number 40. My favorite story of all time, just because it's insane, is there was this player named Greg Fields who played for the uh, L.A. Express. Greg Fields played originally. He, was in the, he came out of Grambling, played for the Baltimore Colts one year. His nickname was Big Paper because um, he made almost no money, and he would call the wealthy players on the, on the call, it's the Big Paper Boys, yeah. and they started calling him Big Paper. He's with the Atlanta Falcons in training camp the next year, gets cut, refuses to leave. Like, literally, fuck you, I'm not leaving. And they're like, Greg, really, you need to leave. I'm not leaving. They get an armed security guard. He's like, okay, I'm leaving. So he leaves. He signs with the LA Express, 1984. The coach of the team is John Hadel. He decides he's going to cut Greg Fields. He... Uh, he calls Greg Fields in. His assistant coach is like, you got to be careful. This guy's kind of crazy. Nah, it'll be fine. He call Greg Fields in. Greg, you've been good, but, you know, I'm really sorry. We have to cut you. He reaches across the table and goes, pop, and punches his coach in the face. People come in or dragging Greg Fields out. Greg Fields is like, I'm going <laughs> to oh, fucking shit. kill you. I'm going to fuck you up. <laughs> blah, blah. Greg Fields starts calling in death threats to the team. Yeah. I'm going to fucking kill yeah. the coach tomorrow. I fucking better not go to practice tomorrow. I'm going to kill him. What the hell? They end up hiring this guy, Nelson Mercado, who at the time was working as Liberace's bodyguard. They bring him to L.A. to guard the Express <laughs> and to keep tabs on Greg Fields. And he starts following Greg Fields around. He's putting tracers on his car. He's tracking his phone calls. He told me Greg Fields kept a gun in his trunk and would, like, show up at the practices and just stare at the coaches. The U.S. of L. was alerted to this behavior. And this is so U.S. of L. it's not even funny. He, uh, the San Antonio gunslingers need a pass rusher. So they sign Greg Fields as a free agent. They bring him in. The coaches greet him wearing helmets and pads as a joke, like, don't hit us. <laughs> he plays, and toward the end of the 85 season, the owner of the Gunslingers, a guy named Clinton Mangus, he runs out of money. He stops paying the players. We well, don't stop playing Gr Greg Fields. Greg Fields one day puts a baseball bat in his car, follows Clinton Mangus home. Clinton Mangus lives in a mansion. It was called the, uh, the Magic Kingdom because it had all these wild animals from all over Africa running in his yard that he imported. Greg Fields pulls up. Clint Mangus gets out of his car. He sees Greg Fields. Greg Fields, six foot six, 280. Clint Mangus, tiny. He's like, oh, hey, Greg. Greg's like, uh, listen, I see where you live. I know you have money. You should probably pay me. Clint Mangus goes, wait right here. Goes in his house 10 minutes later, $17,000 in cash. Wow. <laughs> Clint wow. Mangus says, that's great. Are we good? 
Greg Fields is like, we're good. You'll never see me again. Drives off. It's now, no one has heard of Greg Fields since. No one, I call Grambling, nobody knows where he is. Teammates, nobody knows where he is. I do a search and I find two addresses. My nine-year-old son, Emmett. I'm like, you want to take a road trip and find Greg Fields? He's like, yes. 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 We drive up to San Francisco, two addresses. We spend one day walking all over the city, walking through the worst parts of the city under piss-smelling bridges and broken bottles. And we finally- So you're downtown San Francisco. <laughs> we don't re- no, we were in the worst part. We're kind of down. <laughs> wow. Turns out it used to be a real crack haven back in the 90s. So- um, we get there, the lockbox on the, on the door. I go to a second address without my son. It's in the projects. I knock on the door. Woman answers. I'm like, hey, I'm Jeff Perel. I'm trying to find Greg Fields. She's like, oh, that's my, uh, that's my brother. I'm like, oh, can you pass on? She's like, I don't talk to him much, but give me your number. I'll try to get it to him. Yeah. 20 minutes later, I get a call, Greg Fields. The next morning, me, my nine-year-old son, Emmett, Greg Fields, sitting in a shopping mall in Sacramento, California, eating Cold Stone Creamery and talking about the USA. Mm-hmm. Wow. Nice. Yeah, it was pretty good. What's your story like that, Nick? You must have something similar. <laughs> yeah, Nick, what you got? <laughs> what I got? Bring it, yeah. Nick. Bring yeah, it, come Nick. on, Nick. Uh, I think the best I got <laughs> is, uh, yeah. I, you know, uh, I would say uh, Willie McCovey. Um, Willie McCovey, we, we, you know, we're doing the Ted Williams story. And we get near the end, and we all along knew, like, you know, it's 2018, and and Ted had, you know, made this great speech at the Hall of Fame, saying that the Negro League players should be inducted, um, and and we didn't have a African American in the film, and we were trying to get Pumpsy Green, who was the first uh, black player on the Red Sox, and also the la- you know, the last team to integrate. But Ted was really nice to Pumpsy Green, and whatever for months we're going back and forth with the Red Sox and we can't get Pumpsy Green. You know, I have Ted Williams on Google alert. And one day I get this thing that says something that McCovey mentions Ted Williams as being important to him. So I call the giants and, uh, it, it's not, it's not nearly as exciting, but some, <laughs> but we got Willie McCovey. Uh, so we, no, yeah, that's cool. what, it was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. That's a good, it always feels great when you track people it, down. It you does, guys. Yeah. It does. Yeah. We we did that with Sly Stone, where Sly is super reclusive, and and uh, I would say he's probably on the spectrum somewhere now. Like nowadays, you'd go, oh, the, the, the social scenes are hard for him. We got him, and he showed up, and you know Sly struggles with uh, substances. You know everybody knows that, and so we're like, hey, we brought some donuts and we brought some fried chicken. Do you want to eat anything? And he says, no, nah, I got some fried chicken in the car. Like, you, you've got you've got car fried chicken. Right. Okay, so we got about who doesn't <laughs> bring fried chicken who in the car? Though? It's yeah. in the car. You know, and he clearly doesn't eat anything ever. But uh, it was funny because, you know, that, that and then you got about 20 minutes of useful stuff out of him because the rest of his brain is just, is just Swiss cheese. Um, or fried chicken. Yeah. yeah. Let crunchy, me, uh, crunchy let's, stuff. <laughs> crunchy. So your book is called Football for a Buck. It's about the USFL. It's awesome. I love all these stories. It seems to me, and I don't want to take up too much of your time, but the USFL is a lot like, so we had Jim DeFelice on. He wrote about the Pony Express. How long do you guys know? Like how long the Pony Express existed for? Now you're not talking about the football Pony Express. I'm talking about yeah, like the original, not like you, the SMU. The, the Pony yeah. Express that took. I think it was not that long. I think it was about 1857 to 1861. It was 18 months. Okay. Wow. Super short, yep. but it sticks in our conscience. Like we love it, and there are so many things named after it. And I think the USFL is kind of like that, where it's one of the few things where it's such a short but brilliant, and for whatever reason, it just you know it sticks. Maybe not with the young kids nowadays, but it is. It does have something. So I really appreciate you you oh, making yeah. it happen and write the book. Well, it's funny because um, I've been asked in some of these interviews, like, why do you think people are so fascinated by the USFL? And my answer: it's the least sexy least good book selling answer ever i'm like i don't really think they are like you have to convince people you know you have to tell people the stories and then they're like holy shit that happened in pro football yeah but it's not like people are clamoring you know like i would love to write a biography of spiro agnew sure truly i would i don't really see the market there for it and i'd be i'd be pitching it and people would be like why do you think people are still fascinated by spiro agnew (laughs) yeah 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 you know it's kind of like the USFL, <laughs> but the stories are so great. It's worth I, telling. I think you know? the USFL is a little sexier than uh, Spiro Ag. Spiro Ag. Yeah, maybe. Is, so. Do you have, I mean, I, I think I would read that. The His great uh, phrase, the nattering nabobs of negativism. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. In my, my high school history teacher was always saying, 
the Spiro Agnew quote, nattering Naples. Yeah, Spiro Agnew is fascinating. Yeah. Doesn't, but fascinating doesn't always mean people want to read a book about it. That's, no, that's true. That's a tough thing. And, and that's the reason I kept getting rejected by the USFL. I have one more question. I know it's not my interview show, but uh, can you tell us why it is called football, football for a buck? Of course. So the, uh, what there was ultimately was a lawsuit against the NFL. It's going to be huge. Yeah, the USFL, it's going to be huge. It's going to be huge. The USFL sued the NFL for antitrust violations. Basically, they said the USFL monopolized fall TV, thereby uh, blocking the USFL from getting a fall TV deal. And they went to court. Trump led the lawsuit. Trump was a star witness. Trump was a terrible witness, like a laughably bad witness for the uh, USFL. He made the USFL the bully against the NFL, which is hard to do. And it's a great, it's a great final moment. I don't want to say I wrote a great, but it's a great final moment in USFL history and football history. The jury deliberates and they come back. And this is a huge trial. This actually is, in Trump terms, a huge trial. It's being covered everywhere nationally. Jury comes back and they announce their findings. The USFL, the NFL is guilty of this, 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 one after the other. Reporters are rushing to their phones to call in their offices. Holy shit, the USFL just won. Pete Rosell, the NFL commissioner, is in his car because he's late to court. He hears on the radio. He turns around in a panic to drive back to the NFL office. Chuck Fusina, the quarterback for the Philadelphia Stars, is taking his mas- uh, some course to get his master's degree at LaSalle University. His teacher stops the class and says, you're not going to believe this, blah, blah, blah. He's like, I got to call my wife. He calls his wife. She's like, well, did you hear the verdict? I mean, did you hear the, uh, the award? He's like, no. So what the jury decided was the USFL was correct. The NFL was monopolizing TV. The NFL was trying to kill the USFL. But the death of the USFL was its own fault, and specifically Donald Trump's fault, that this fall move was misguided, that it was a stupid idea that couldn't work. And you can blame the NFL all you want, and that's fair, but the USFL needed to look in the mirror. And the final uh, summary they gave them was a dollar. And under antitrust laws, triple to three. So the name of the book is Football for a Buck because it was rewarded a buck. That's so good. Ta-da. Ta-da. Yeah, and I guess I'll, I want to say this. One of, uh, one of my classmates passed away a couple weeks ago from heart failure, and his, his USFL tie is this. When we were kids in high school, our, our colors were blue and gold, and the Oakland Invaders, which is, were from that area, uh, they also had a gold color scheme, and we could not find a high school kid's helmet big enough to fit his big melon. And so Kevin Monahan wore a old Oakland Invaders helmet. Wow. In the, in like, you know, we were 86, 87 time frame. So I guess it was probably our senior year. And so, yeah, I mean, there's a helmet sitting somewhere for like a man-sized man, and that's what Kevin was. And so it's his tie, and it's it's my way of, uh, you know, ha- tipping my hat to Kevin. He was a, he's one of those guys that when he passes, everybody was like, man, I love that guy. You know, and it was it's a shame to lose him. If but, only Kevin uh, were around, I yeah. can tell you, why I was working on this book on eBay Someone who worked for the Invaders, I think their equipment guy, was selling a locker filled oh my with Invaders helmets, jerseys, playbooks, everything you could think of, shoes, pants, but it was like $30,000. <laughs> and if I had the Donald Trump money, yeah. I would have bought that locker. Yeah. And my wife would have said, what the fuck did you what just buy this for? And, <laughs> and like, it would be like totally decked yeah, out. Yeah, my kid would be like <laughs> souped up forever. Yeah. Any, uh, any final notes at all, Nick? Uh, it sounds so good. Uh, uh, the one other thing I think I read someplace um, is like the best trade I, I think I've ever heard of in sports history. Oh, yeah. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah, it was uh, after the first season. The sh- so the owner of the Chicago Blitz was a guy named Ted Dietrich, and he lived in Arizona. And he got tired of making nine three-hour chartered jet flights per year. You know, that could be exhausting because what if they don't have your preferred taste of soda or mustard? So – only in the U.S. of L. They came up with a solution to make his life easier. We'll just trade the Chicago team for the Arizona team. So yeah. the Chicago Blitz players became the Arizona Wranglers. The Arizona Wranglers players became the Chicago Blitz. The Blitz had been a great team. The Wranglers had been a sucky team. So now the Blitz are sucky and the Wranglers are great. And here's the <laughs> awesome part. Marv Levy, the future great coach of the Buffalo Bills, was hired to coach the Chicago Blitz. Only no one re- told him that the teams were traded for each other. So he shows up thinking he's going to have this great team. And he has the shitty Arizona Wranglers from a year earlier. <laughs> it's a kind of a movie. Oh, it's great. And even better, the new owner of the Blitz is this guy, James Hoffman. He was a doctor based out of Chicago. He did not have as much money as he, as he claimed to have. They play two exhibition games. After the second game, he's walking off the field with one of the team's players, a guy named Dan Jiggets. And uh, the owner says, uh, James Hoffman says to Jiggets, he's like, yeah, I'm out of here. And Jiggets says, oh, where are you going? And he's like, no, no, no. I'm out of here. I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. What? Yeah, I'm, I'm just... 
I don't want to own this team anymore. He literally dumped the team. Not literally. He figuratively dumped the team on the side of the road. He just decided, I don't want to own a team anymore. So he didn't sell it. He didn't give it to a friend. Just threw it away. And the US of L had to take over. And the final moment of that is the US of L takes over and they're cutting salaries because they have, they're just, they can't afford it. And the general manager of the team, they fire him and he locks himself in his office after he's fired, just starts calling all the different media in Chicago. You're not going to believe the fucked up shit going around here. One <laughs> after the other after the other. That is the USFL. And this is Jeff Perlman. And you guys have to get his book because there are so many great stories. And it's called Football for a Buck. We also have Nick co-hosting. Thank you so much. you got to check out his documentary on the life of Ted Williams. Fellas, thank you for doing the Breakdown Show. Thank you. This I really great. appreciate you. Thanks, yeah, thanks a lot. That was awesome. No, thank you.